So I'm from iRobot, right? We make the Roomba, and we are 100% serverless in production. We run no EC2, we run no Docker, we're all on AWS. Um, and as Kelsey said at the beginning, uh, the tech for serverless is now, but I still think that serverless is, is the future because the mindset shift is the thing that we haven't gotten to. And so fundamentally the question is, you know, what do you do as a business, right? And for iRobot, we're a device company. We're a connected device company, but we're not a cloud technology company. We're a cloud-enabled features company. We don't want to own cloud technology for its own sake. We want to uh, create cloud-enabled features for our customers. And we want to do that in a, as lightweight way as possible. So focusing on what you do is asking that question, what do you do as a business and what differentiates you? And for any work that, that is not a differentiator for you, ask why you're doing it. And then it's recursive, for the thing that differentiates you. What parts of it uh, are you doing that you could not be doing? And the key thing, the thing that serverless approaches problems with is that you shouldn't have to solve technology problems before you can solve your business problems. You should just be able to attack your business problems with technology. And so in this way, serverless is about focus. And how do we focus, right? We have limited attention, we have limited resources to apply to problems. And therefore, focus is about making trade-offs. So how can you pay less attention to this undifferentiated heavy lifting? You get someone else to do it, right? This is always part of you know, being a lean business, is paying other people to do stuff so that you don't have to do it yourself. And in cloud technology, this means using managed services. And so in terms of understanding serverless, and this is, um, you know, it gets often equated with Lambda and, um, or other functions as a service platforms. But this misses the bigger picture and the smaller picture. Um, it's both about more than functions as a service and compute is about more than functions as a service by itself. So when you're serverless, you want to use and misuse managed services wherever you can. This is about being serviceful. That was a term coined by Patrick Dubois, the inventor of the term DevOps. And it's really you know, a great term for the mindset because the compute that you're using is actually a small part of your overall solution. It's really about how do I apply managed services to everything. And you want to glue it together with managed ephemeral compute of which functions as a service is one example but there are other examples. On AWS, right, Lambda is the functions as a service, but AWS Glue is a fully managed Spark system that's serverless. So you can just bring your Python code, um, you know, using PySpark or whatever, and apply it to um, a computation problem without having to manage any of the underlying Spark infrastructure. So being about more than just functions as a service, right, the what of serverless is being serviceful using ephemeral compute, which is not always functions. Um, you want your resources built to go towards your resources used, and you want a smaller and more abstract control plane. But more important than the what is the why, right? It's lower cost. People often save money by moving to serverless. It's lower operations burden, right? We sell millions of robots a year, and we're able to run our production serverless infrastructure with you know, a handful of people, like one and a half FTE. Um, you get a faster time to market. Um, you get to focus on business value. And that's really the key, right, is about that focus. So uh, you want to use managing services, managed services in preference to building and or hosting your own solution, right? Not just building, but also hosting, um, even when those services don't quite fit your needs. And I'll talk about this a little more later, but you want to say, well, is it, you know, this isn't 100% of what I need, but how much work is it to get that 100% by doing it by myself? So going back here, um, when you're using managed services, so Conway's law says your software architecture is gonna match your organizational structure. And using managed services in such an extensive way where um, means that your architecture is gonna be radically different from when you're able to build servers. 
And so if you look at Conway's law that says your software architecture is going to match your organization, if you're trying to do something that's very different architecturally, you need to make sure that your organization is set up to do it. And that's, I think, a really key point, um, that it's not just a technological transformation. It's an organizational, it's a cultural transformation. So what does it mean for your organization? Um, it means that the paradigm of outsourcing undifferentiated heavy lifting must be embraced by your culture. And in this sense, using managed services is an exercise in trust. So um, when you're handing off some part of your application to somebody else to run, right, you're not in control of that part of your application. And you only know what that provider is going to tell you about how they're architected what their security is, what their performance is, and what metrics they give you. And the metrics piece is extremely important because how that thing is performing, you only know by what metrics they give you. AWS IoT is a big part of our solution. And when it launched, it had a small number of metrics that gave us insight into some things. But there were a lot of things that could go wrong that we couldn't detect or alarm for. And now it's got, you know, a huge number of metrics that, that show all of these things. And, uh, and that's you know, been a great help to us. But you have to understand that when you're looking at a service, you have to accept where it is at that moment and understand that, that it grows over time, and the, f the features and the functionality. Um, but again, it's about saying, is this thing going to solve enough of my problem to make it worth it? by the amount of resources and time that I'm saving that I can apply towards my business problems. Of course, you may not be able to remediate a provider's outage, which is probably the scariest piece, right? Because you no longer control your own destiny. And that's an uncomfortable feeling. There's no getting around that. It's never going to be easy to say, yeah, if something happens, it's out of our control as to when it will be solved. And Coming from a place where we've built a lot of our technology solutions, that's a big jump for us. But there are so many parts of your business that uh, you rely on trusted providers to provide you things, right? You don't build all of your HR systems, likely, right? Um, you don't, you rely on an electricity provider, right? And you may try and remediate that by having backup generators, but they probably don't power all of your systems. They probably power some critical things that you're spending time on, on remediating that risk for. And everything else is like, well, OK, this part of the building is just going to be without power, and those people can go home for the day. Right? That may be an acceptable um, amount of business risk that you take on based on the cost of remediating it. And you also need to remember that trust is a journey. Right? That, that when you start with a given provider, you're going to be at one place in terms of how much you trust them. But by working with them over time, you can gain trust. You can start to understand how they operate and that that can grow over time. So it's an investment. And so serverless, in some ways, is, is minimalist, right? It's about don't own what you don't have to, right? Only take the things uh, under control that, uh, that you really need to. So there are a lot of distractions on this path. So the meaning of serverless is one, containers are another, and multi-cloud is, is a third. So here's the thing about serverless. It's a terrible name. Nobody likes it. I don't think anyone in this room would stand up and defend the name as the appropriate term, the most good term for it. But we're stuck with it. There's no changing it. There's no going back. Uh, so get over it. It's going to become meaningless. Um, it already pretty much is, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Um, for me, the primary metric for how serverless something is, and it's how serverless something is, not is it serverless or not. It is a spectrum. There are varying degrees of serverlessness. Um, how managed is it? How much work do I have to put in to make, it, uh, to make it work? And then the next thing is, am I charged per usage? Right. So if there's something that is completely managed, but I'm billed at a very you know, granular level, and so I can, I can end up paying for sort of resources that I don't use. To me, that can still be serverless. It's not as serverless as if I was getting billed for just my usage. But if I had to choose between 
being billed for just my usage and a lot of management overhead and some wasted money, but much less resources applied to it, I would choose, I would choose that. And so when talking about what is serverless, there's, there's some sleight of hand that happens because there are two kinds of servers that we can have. So infrastructure servers like virtual machines and application servers like Node.js, Tomcat, any of these things, right? And you're really fully serverless. You're only all the way down that spectrum when both are managed, that you don't have to care about the infrastructure part and you don't have to care about the application part. And a container that's active when it's not handling data is a server. It doesn't matter if the VM underneath is transparent to you, you don't have to worry about it. That container is managed. If it has an indefinite lifetime and is, is again, active if it's not handling data, then you still have a server and you still need to maintain that. You still need to monitor its you know, resource usage um, to make sure that you are uh, um, using it. Now, even if you go Further than that, a function that's running on your infrastructure is not fully serverless. So hosted functions as a service, right? You're still managing the underlying infrastructure. You have a ways to go. That doesn't mean it can't be a valid choice, but just be honest with yourself about you know, how far in, uh, in the actual utility of serverless you are, and not just that you've checked a buzzword box. So let's talk about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes on managed virtual machines is, is serverless for the Kubernetes admins, right? They're not worried about virtual machines, and that's great. That's a step. But you have Kubernetes admin to do, and that's management overhead for you. That's resources that you're applying to a technology problem. And you have management of whatever you're running on top of Kubernetes. So any of those applications, which may run application servers, again. Um, so now, what if you run hosted functions as a service or any of these other you know, platforms that, don't, that skip the application notion of a server on hosted Kubernetes so you don't have the virtual uh, machine notion of a server? You still have Kubernetes maintenance in the middle and maintenance of that hosted software. You're going to have to upgrade it, right? You have to manage that software now. It's in your hands. All of this is undifferentiated heavy lifting. Again, that doesn't mean it's not a valid choice for your organization, especially when you're you know, working on that path from where you are today to where you want to be. But just be honest about how much undifferentiated heavy lifting you still have and that you could still get rid of. I think there are a lot of uh, we're in danger of a lot of things getting called serverless and adopting them and people feeling, oh, this is as good as, you know, I'm serverless now, there isn't a better place that I could be at. So they stop working towards removing more undifferentiated heavy lifting. So last thing I'll talk about here is multi-cloud. So this is a big thing, vendor lock-in, as people are worried about. Um, but it's not a real threat. Um, and the reason that it's not a real threat um, well, first, let's talk about what the cost of mitigation is, right? The cost to mitigate, you know, being locked into a vendor, you develop an abstraction layer. And that abstraction layer uh, is always going to have just the lowest common denominator across all cloud vendors. So you're not going to be able to take advantage of the, um, the full benefits of the features that your cloud provider is providing that are unique to them. So you, you're kneecapping yourself, um, and for what? So cow tipping is this purported activity in rural areas where people go out and they try and push cows over. And it was an urban legend for a long time. People debated about whether it was even possible or not, but there's an easy proof that it's not possible to tip cows, just that there are no videos of it on YouTube. <laughs> if it was possible, there would be videos. In the same way, if you look at all of the people talking about multi-cloud, everyone's talking about their strategy. No one is out there saying, we went multi-cloud and it really saved us, or we didn't go multi-cloud and here's how it came back to bite us in the end. There are no stories of people actually encountering the need for it. 
And so again, it's resources that you're applying towards a problem that's, that's mitigated. You look at Spotify, right? They picked up from AWS and moved to Google. They're not out there saying, we're, we're not all in on Google. We're abstracting over Google so if, if we have to move again, we'll, it will be easier. They're all in on Google. They understand that even if they have to move again, it's worth it to take advantage of Google uh, in the time that they have there. So adopting a serverless mindset is about staying focused on total cost of ownership. Um, it's almost noon, so I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, but just keep your eye on everything. Your operations salary should come out of the same budget as your cloud bill. Because when you take on hosting of something, it may, you know, on a per compute cycle basis, EC2 is cheaper than Lambda. But when you take into account all of the people you have to apply towards it, your cost is higher. Encourage a focus on business value. So in, uh, in the cultural shift, in the mindset shift, you wanna get developers connected to the business value that they're creating. And your team met metrics should reflect this, right? Your developers should care about solving business problems and not solving technology problems. But we've been solving technology problems for so long that that's what we tend to care about first. And we need ways of connecting our developers to the business problems that they need to be solving. Um, and again, the hardest part of software engineering is always people. Uh, you have to be okay with Rube Goldberg machines. Um, and the truth is that uh, there's always duct tape in serverless. This is that thing about services being uh, um, not 100% of what you need, right? So when you encounter a service, a managed service that's 80%, 90% of what you need, you wanna ask, well, can I make this do the thing that I want it to do? Or can I, can I figure out a way to work this into my application? So for us, that's meant being using uh, DynamoDB almost exclusively uh, and not SQL databases because they don't play well with Lambda today. And so we have data that is fairly relational in nature that we still store in DynamoDB and do those joins on the client side, like in code in Lambda. And that's because DynamoDB is a much better fit for Lambda than SQL databases in RDS on AWS. Um, and that's fine. Like that's an acceptable thing given that the benefits that it brings to us uh, in terms of total cost of ownership. The difference between being all serverless and mostly serverless is huge for operations, right? You know, so we have no EC2, we have no Docker, and it basically runs itself. There's very little operations work that we need to apply towards it. And someday we're gonna have to add in some containers to do something that we just can't accomplish any other way. And it's gonna be a big jump in the amount of effort we need to apply. So being all in has a lot of benefits um, that, that you gain that you don't see coming if you're, if you're approaching it from, the, from a having servers direction. Um, so it's not easy, but it's worth it. Um, and you may be skeptical, but you know, the important thing is not what, it's the why, and really it's about focusing on business value, right? And the truth is that it's only gonna get easier um, as time goes on, as platforms get better, and as our options for plugging all this stuff together becomes more standardized and, and, and more integrated. So two questions. One, will you uh, be sharing the slides at all? I can, yeah. Okay, that'd be great. Uh, second question is, is what is your advice for large corporations looking to um, transition to, uh, from these huge monolithic applications that have been built over you know, 30, 40 years to, to get to this, you know, this end state vision? Oh yeah, so there are, there are a couple of things. And I think specifically yep. you might mean a bank. Uh, maybe. Maybe a, a big bank. For sure. <laughs> So I think there, there are a couple of things. One is operations is always a great gateway for serverless, both because operations intimately understands, oh, I can do less work to manage this. Yeah. Um, and it's also easier to take you know, things that are uh, you know, run book scripts and things and just make them into functions and show the worth of having functions as a service in there. Um, Moving to managed services for things that, you're, uh, that you have, you know, sort of existing stuff. Um, databases tend to be a good place there where you can move from, you know, an on-prem database solution to a managed 
data thing, and you know, AWS even has database migration services now um, to help with that. So, you know, and replacing queuing um, uh, with services can be helpful. Um, I think the other piece is that if you have a big enough organization, right, Amazon.com uses Lambda, and in some sense that is on-prem. Uh, but, but it's not useful to talk about it as on-prem, right? It's serverless because the distance between those teams is high enough that it may as well be another company. And if you're big enough and you can have, you know, an on-prem hosted functions as a service platform that's run by teams that don't need to interact with any of the users of it, if you're, if you're another team in the company, you can just use that as a service and it's as close to coming from outside the organization as possible, that's good enough, right? You know, the organization as a whole isn't serverless, but the team using it is. Um, and you know, when I talk, when I think about what's useful in, in transitioning to serverless, between somebody using like AWS Lambda and a bunch of hosted databases and messaging and all that behind it, versus someone using you know all managed services for everything but their compute and running functions as a service on Kubernetes, the latter is more serverless to me, right? It's more useful to have all of those pieces that aren't part of your core logic as managed services than that compute piece.